relevance to this discussion. Um, so uh, most of our work, as the name of my center suggests, focuses on sustainability uh, rather than health or equity explicitly. But um, the good news is that as we work towards a sustain more sustainable transportation system, that is also a healthier and more equitable transportation system. So, so that's great. Um, now, how this works in a very basic sense is that we make investments in the transportation system, and then those investments help to shape our land development patterns, which then influence the choices that we all make on a daily basis about our travel, uh, which then has health implications with uh, this particular graphic is also worried about the cost of those health implications. Now, uh, the question is, what choices are we making at the upstream end of this? What kind of investments are we making in our transportation system? And then what does that lead to? Well, you all know what we've been doing in California. We've been building highways, which are contributing to very low density patterns of development, uh, which are also shaped by our land use policies that prioritize single family uh, housing and so on and so forth. So, uh, so that's what we get, and what it means is that we are choosing to do a whole lot of driving, not just in California, but the rest of the U.S. And this is, oh, we, we measure in the transportation world, we measure driving in terms of vehicle miles of travel. So the big buzzword in California these days is BMT. And you can see that VMT per capita, you know, steady increases for decades. It has flattened out a little bit, but don't let this fool you into thinking that the problem is solved because it's probably coming back up even after the COVID uh, blip. And then, uh, of course, the corollary to this is that we're not doing a whole lot of what we call active travel. Active travel includes walking, biking, uh, but usually we put transit in there as well, because a lot of times people are walking to and from transit and the research shows that people who use transit are getting more physical activity than people who are driving. Uh, and we, we don't do very much of this and you compare us to lots of other countries with similar economies and we're doing a whole lot less of this than everybody else. So, um, so that leads to lots of health concerns and traditionally um, you know, the transportation field has been concerned about safety, and we all know the issues there. Um, the air quality issue came along in the 1960s and became more of a focus of the transportation field. Uh, and of course, we've made a lot of progress there, though we have a lot more progress to make. Um, and don't forget about other kinds of pollution that transportation contribute to, like water pollution and noise pollution. Um, more recently, there's been a focus on the role of transportation with respect to physical activity, and there was a coming together of um, kind of the transportation planning world with the subset of the public health world that focuses on physical activity, uh, kind of starting in the late 1990s, um, that's had a big impact on how we think about things. Um, but, uh, you know, the problem is that most Americans aren't getting as much physical activity as they should be getting. And partly that has to do with the fact that they're driving and they're not walking and biking places. And then uh, another um, recent focus, more recent focus, is on the role of transportation providing access and then the connection um, between access and health. So things like access to healthy food, so we talk about food deserts and the role that transportation plays in that, access to um, medical care. Um, I mean, obviously these are not just transportation issues, but transportation uh, is a part of the issue. Um, and then, you know, even things like, um, uh, you know, access to friends and family and sort of the, the social networks that are important to, to people's health. And it occurs to me, listening to the previous talk, that um, if we're talking about hazards, then I should probably have egress up here too. Uh, when we think about people's needs to escape in the face of hazards, and we certainly know about that in California. Um, across all of these, uh, health concerns are really significant equity concerns. So. 
Obviously, people who aren't able to drive for one reason or another um, have much poorer access than those of us who can't drive. Um, safety risks, you know, people who aren't able to drive are more dependent on walking, biking, and transit, and that exposes them to more safety risks. And of course, it's the most vulnerable and the lowest income shares of our population who are dependent on walking, biking, and transit, and, um, and then pollution risks. So you all are very familiar with those and the equity uh, issues associated with that. Okay, so our work, um, at least indirectly, uh, is about improving the healthiness of travel. Uh, we focus on sustainability, but it is working towards healthiness as well. So um, there's work that looks at reducing the harms of driving, because we're doing a lot of driving and that's not going to go away. So how do we reduce the impacts of driving? But then we can also think about changing behavior. So what if we could get people to drive less? And what if we could get people to uh, walk, bike, and use transit more? Uh, so can we get people to shift to healthier modes of travel? So I have a lot of colleagues who focus on the reducing driving harms question. Um, so we've got a plug-in and electric plug-in hybrid and electric vehicle research center um, that's doing a lot of work on um, the adoption of electric vehicles and policies to encourage the adoption of electric vehicles. Um, so if you're interested in that topic, that would be a place to go. Um, infrastructure is another thing we have to think about if we want to reduce the harms of driving. You know, even if we convert to all electric vehicles, we're still, they're still using our roads and our roads have all kinds of negative impacts on the environment uh, and thus health. Um, so we can think about how we design our roadway system and the materials we use in our system. Um, here, I would point you to our uh, University of California Paving Research Center, which is based here at UC Davis, where they do a lot of work on sustainable pavements, uh, reducing the environmental impacts, but also think about things like the heat island effect, and how pavements contribute to that. And then uh, another thing we need to think about is how people drive. And I would say we're not doing so much of that kind of research here, uh, but colleagues down at Berkeley um, uh, do think about these sorts of issues as well. Okay, so that's reducing the harms of driving. Uh, most of my work focuses on this question, how do we shift to healthier travel? And I wanna point out that you can, you can think about this in both directions. So we can focus on reducing driving through various sorts of strategies like pricing and some other things I'll mention in a moment. Um, and then that, you know, so the reduction in driving itself is a goal, but also that helps to then increase active travel if we're shifting people in that direction. But what I want to point out is that we've got to be a little bit careful because um, we don't necessarily want to reduce travel because travel is important for people's health. It's, you know, it's access to all kinds of things that are important to their lives. So we want to reduce driving without necessarily reducing travel. Uh, and then we can think about it the other way around, which is uh, focusing on strategies for increasing active travel, um, walking, biking, transit, which should help to reduce driving. You know, if some of those walking and biking trips substitute for driving trips. So we've done research, for example, on the use of bike share systems and to what degree they're substituting for driving. Um, but you know, not all of that new walking and biking will replace driving. Some of that could be increased travel. But here we get a, a smiley face because that's fine. You know, people are walking and biking more, even if they're not driving less. That's a good thing from a health standpoint. Okay, so here's my little formula for how do we actually get people to drive less? And of course it's not as easy as I'm going to make it look, but uh, this is how we think about it and it kind of gives some framework for the kind of work that we do. Um, the first step is that you've got to make it possible to drive less. Most people in the U.S., you talk about, you know, you, you, you need to drive less. What are they going to say? They're going to say, I can't. You know, I, I need to drive to do the things that I need to do. 
So we need to make it possible. That's the first step. And that's where land use policies are really important uh, in terms of a better mix of land uses and higher densities that make it possible for people to drive less. We need to think about the connectivity of our network. Uh, we've done a really good job of that in Davis in terms of uh, a really interconnected bicycle network. And then just in general, making sure we're, we're not just putting money into roads, but also thinking about the quality of travel for bicycles and pedestrians and transit riders. Oh, and yeah, and then this is all about uh, shorter di distances to destinations, because that is a way to make walking and biking possible. But of course, that doesn't mean people are going to do it. So we also think about strategies for encouraging people to drive less once they have that possibility. And you can use the stick approach, which is where strategies like pricing are really important. And um, you know, we're talking about that in San Francisco and LA, those important pricing that would um, discourage driving at least at certain times and certain places. Um, there's a lot of policy around parking and making parking less abundant and less free and less convenient. That would be a way to discourage driving. Uh, but then there's also the stick approach, which is to make all the alternatives more attractive. Uh, and I like to think about the, the fun factor here. And we know that's a part of what's gone on with um, the shared electric scooter systems that people are riding. You know, it's a cool thing to do. People like it. So if we can make the alternatives to driving the, the fun, cool thing to do, that's going to help as well. And then again, my caveat that, um, yeah, we want to reduce driving, but um, not necessarily all of it. Uh, we want to reduce the bad driving, you know, the driving that is worse for our health and for the environment. Um, but, you know, the driving from which we derive benefits, um, you know, we, we've got to be careful about that too. And uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of a, a UC Davis, UCLA debate in the transportation world is what do we do about low income households? Um, you know, and their need to get to get to jobs when a tran the transit system isn't going to work for them, and their need to have cars at the same time that we're we're trying to reduce people's dependence on cars. So there there are a lot of equity issues around um, this notion of reducing. Okay, a little bit about the work we're doing. Uh, a lot of it is motivated by California's efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, led by the California Air Resources Board. And you look at the numbers and passenger vehicles are over a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions in the state. So that's why we're talking about reducing um, driving. It's, uh, it's not always an easy thing to talk about. And one thing, um, you know, so CARB is very focused on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but they recognize that you can't sell the idea just on that. So there's a lot of talk about co-benefits, the co-benefits of reducing driving. Um, and that's where health comes in and equity as well, because if we can, if we can do these things that it's going to take to reduce driving, that's good for health. That's also good for, for equity. So we've done some work to, to help kind of articulate all of these, these co-benefits. Um, another thing we've done for CARB is synthesize the research that's out there about the effectiveness of a whole bunch of different strategies that might be used at the state, um, regional, or local level to, to help reduce driving. And we've got a new project with them to update all of these syntheses. And this time around, there's going to be a big emphasis on equity as a part of this, um, this effort as well. Uh, I have a, a colleague, Elisa Barber, who does a lot of our land use work, looking at the adoption of um, policies at the local level that would promote less car dependent sort, sort of developments or uh, what we call transit oriented developments. Um, the state is trying to get local governments to do this. Local governments say, it's our, you know, we get to decide what kind of land use we want. Um, so it's been a long, slow slog to bring about this kind of change. And she's been looking at um, what's been going on and what some of the barriers are. 
Uh, one of the fun things we, we did uh, a year or two ago was create this little thing called a reduced travel calculator. Um, this is uh, a little online tool that lets somebody uh, estimate how much additional vehicle miles of travel there would be if Caltrans widened a highway in a particular place for a particular distance. Um, this is a big issue as a part of the environmental review process for these highway projects. We haven't been analyzing um, this effect very much. We call this the induced travel effect. Um, and so we developed this little calculator that's now being used um, in the environmental review process. And um, it's gotten quite a lot of buzz around the country. And in fact, the uh, Rocky Mountain Institute developed a national version of this that just went live last week. So it sounds a little transportation nerdy, but this is a really exciting and fun, um, fun sort of thing. Um, related to highways, we've got another project going on for Caltrans where we are looking at, uh, we're doing case studies of highways that were built back in the 60s and into the 70s, uh, back when we were building highways through lower income communities of color and essentially wiping them out. And so we're going back and taking a look at what happened in, in certain communities in California and trying to tell um, those stories. And then I think this is the last one I wanted to mention is another project for CARB where we're thinking about uh, what's changed under COVID. You know, we stopped driving for a while, but now we're driving more. Transit crashed, but it's coming back a little bit. Uh, what about remote work, online shopping, all these changes that have been happening under COVID? Um, what are the equity implications of all of that? And what can the state do to make sure we get good things out of this and that we don't kind of fall back on bad uh, habits? Oh, and then I should mention we do a lot of bicycling research as well, which I'm always happy to talk about if you want to hear more. And then just um, my final thought is uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about we, you know, the way we used to do things in transportation was all about making it easier to drive. What we need to be doing is making it easier to not drive. And that's good for health and that's good for equity. And the field is slowly but surely um, moving in that direction. So hopefully uh, that gives you a little taste of what we do in transportation and how it ties into this question of health.